this is Nina G and this is another edition of the comedy time capsule and today Mike Bucci is joining me say hello Mike hi Nina how you doing good how are you good I'm doing good as well as I can be stuck in the house yeah, yeah. well yeah and we're gonna get to all that <laughs> um, but can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and if you have anything to plug uh, sure uh, my name is Mike Bucci. I'm from Newark, California. I'm actually fairly new to the comedy scene. I've been in about eight months, uh, 10 months if you count the two months of quarantine. Uh, I don't have much to plug right now. Uh, I also happen to serve as the city council member from Newark. So if you're into uh, local politics, I have a Zoom meeting every second and fourth Thursday that's really exciting. <laughs> um, and those are open to the public? They are, actually, they are. Okay. So we we do it, uh, there's been a lot of trouble with people kind of dropping into Zoom meetings and, you know, causing a ruckus. So we, we set it up a little differently so you can't do that. But yeah, they're, you know, they're fun. If, you, okay. if you're into that sort of thing, which I am, so. Okay, great. <laughs> I didn't know you had Zoom experience that way. So that's great. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let me see. What made you get into comedy? Well, you know what's funny is um, I think a lot of my friends and family were surprised when they found out, you know, I was getting into politics and was running for a position. Nobody was shocked when they heard I was doing some comedy. So uh, out of my friends, you know, I've always been the jokester and have a lot of fun doing that, and my family too. Uh, but earlier this year, actually, I guess before I tell that story, I should say it probably started uh, at my mother-in-law's 60th birthday. We threw her a surprise party, and I had uh, contacted my buddy, me and Dave, who was also from Newark, to come and do a set. And, you know, I, I had the mic, and I told a couple jokes to the group, probably 50 folks, and he recommended me for Drew Harmon's I Bet I'd Be Good at That. So I participated in that and uh, had the interesting experience of having my first time up be at the punchline in San Francisco, which was, you know, pretty wild. And uh, I love it. So I've, I've stuck with it and it's, uh, it's been a great eight months for the most part, yeah. Can you say a little bit about that show and that process? Yeah, you know, uh, I know Drew's done it with several people. Um, I. I think I'm the only one that's really kind of continued on, right, and, and enjoyed doing it and hits open mics and things on my own. Uh, the process was, was pretty cool. The way I understand it is a lot of the comics have written stuff for some of the people who go up and do it once. Um, I wrote a lot of my own kind of things and my own stories and my own direction, and then we would get together and kind of talk in the comics that were involved. Uh, kind of helped me hone that in, right? Because I wanted to talk about this and they were like, no, no, no. You need to kind of direct it and you, you don't need to say 12 words when four will do. So they really helped me kind of refine it and uh, helped me punch it up quite a bit. And I think, um, and, and you know, I, I can't say for sure. I mean, everybody comes at this from a different experience, but I think uh, my public speaking and then having that month five weeks of, of working with those seasoned comics um, kind of gave me a pretty strong foundation to, to continue to write and, and to perform just because uh, I think they helped me avoid some of the pitfalls that you'll see uh, a lot of new comics kind of do, you know, so it was so good. So what are some of those pitfalls? Well, well, a couple things. One, I'm glad I got Mean Dave. Mean Dave's kind of my, uh, my, my comedy, uh, coach, if you will, right? And I, I like that I have him to bounce things off of because there are certain jokes that you, I just, you know, shouldn't be telling. And uh, some, of the, some of the things that I've seen people do at open mics that are, you know, ugh, cringeworthy, um, I've been able to avoid some of that stuff. So, you know, I, I think that uh, I probably got six or t 12 months of experience just in that first month of them mm -hmm. saying, don't do that right? Don't do that. Nobody remembered to tell me to move the mic stand, though, for my first time out. So, you know, that's one of the things they didn't cover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and did you think that you were just going to do it that one night and that was it? And, and it would be over with? What Was it a shock to you that you wanted to do it more? Uh, you know, I, um, I wouldn't say it was a shock, right? I probably didn't anticipate enjoying it as much as I did. And um, really to, to have the drive to continue in the way I have, that was not, that was kind of un, unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do, you know, through the politics, I give, you know, spend a lot of time in the public, and I've actually been hosting uh, movies in the park here in town for, this should have been our eighth year. Um, so I will get in front of crowds and, you know, warm them up and, and do different things, and I've always really enjoyed interjecting humor in not just that realm, but in the political realm, right? So we, we did that, and uh, it, it's funny, there was a you know, I, I think that I actually kind of had a strong connection with an audience member that night, which also kind of gave me a boost and, and pushed me to continue to do it. So there was a lot of things at play. Um, honestly, politics can be pretty brutal. You think uh, the open mic circuit, it will beat you up, get, in, get into local politics, you know? So I, I feel like over the last 10 years of doing that work uh, in a lot of ways, you know, you kind of lose part of yourself, not necessarily um, you know, my morals or values or anything like that, nothing that bad, but just kind of your own personality and you tend to be a little more reserved and a little more responsible because we're doing serious work here. And uh, getting up on stage and telling jokes kind of helped me get back in touch with myself in a lot of ways, right? And kind of ex express myself for who I am and not so much... Uh, that public eye person, so I really enjoy it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was and and right before you you said that, I wrote down this question, which is, did comedy make you a better politician? Do you think that makes you more relatable? I mean, right now we have a president who um, is influenced by his time in the wrestling world, and I think he brings that onto the political stage. Um, do you find some benefits of being a comedian on the political stage? You know, I've always uh, told people, if you want to run for office, you need three things, right? You need thick skin, you need a sense of humor, and you need backbone. And mm -hmm. um, I've always felt that, you know, I, I took those three things into, into politics and those three things have uh, helped me well in, with my comedy. So it's, it's fun. I think being, um, being able to interject some humor into serious conversations and things kind of will lighten the mood sometimes. And, you know, having humorous analogies never hurt when you're trying to get a serious point across. So yeah, it, it absolutely has helped and, and vice versa. I think all that public speaking and standing in front of groups and, you know, if you can stand in front of somebody in a room full of folks or on their doorstep and talk politics when they don't want to talk to you, you know, it's, it's a good uh, transition to be able to stand up in a room full of people and tell jokes that, you know, maybe they're not thrilled about. Yeah, no, it totally sounds like an open mic at the Florence. So yeah. that, that <laughs> yeah, makes my whole mic. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I was once there and someone threatened to kill me. So it was an exciting oh. night. Wow. Yeah. No, but it, like it was cool. Everything was totally fine. That like everyone was fine. He was just super drunk and thought I said that he had a small dick and then responded. So he kind of heard what he wanted to hear because I didn't say that. I said that my brother, I implied that my brother had a small dick. So that's how all that went down. Well, uh, so but Lawrence, that vibe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, what did, and so before all of this, what did a typical week of comedy look like? Oh, well, well, you mentioned the flow. So the Florence, you know, uh, shout out to Jeff Morse is my home mic because it's in Fremont. I'm in Newark. So I go there every Tuesday and uh, that's a, that can be a tough room, right? So uh, kind of working that out and getting my licks in there has helped me go other places. Uh, so I would do that every Tuesday and then Unfortunately, you know, uh, Jorge Sanchez's uh, mic down at uh, Cafe Frascati got shut down and under new ownership, but we would go down there and check that out. And um, I would do a few things around here. There's a, a few mics in 
Union City and Hayward, mostly East Bay and, and San Jose type things. But then I will run over the hill into Santa Cruz and go check out uh, DNA's Comedy Lab and uh, go down there whenever I can and, and do that, which is, you know, a lot of fun. So I, uh, I also have some eye issues, right? Nina, you know this. I only have one eye and the one eye I got isn't so great. So uh, the blind tiger was always... Uh, <laughs> Ironically enough, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so were you just doing mostly open mics or were you getting booked on shows? What did the booking situation look like? So it's, you know, it's interesting because I was doing a lot of open mics. Um, and then I is I kind of was putting months in and stuff. Uh, I was getting a little more opportunity and you know I mentioned me and Dave earlier that's my buddy we're friends and he uh, definitely opened up a few doors for me right and he recommended me for things uh, it was funny one night I got introduced and they said uh, this guy is comes highly recommended from our headliner me and Dave and I said uh, he only recommended me because he needed a ride to the show tonight so it was uh, you know it's it's fun and I, I, I tease him but uh, there was a lot of opportunity that Dave kind of uh, helped me get and then I want to say probably about six months in the last two months, we're actually going pretty good. I started kind of getting some calls from folks and was able to book a couple showcases a month um, on my own, which was exciting. And uh, some of the other com comedians started recognizing me and, you know, they said, oh, yeah, I saw Bucci at so-and-so and he was, he was pretty funny. So, you know, I think when people see you and they realize that you actually are funny, uh, it, it creates opportunity for you, you know? And then this happened. <laughs> and so yeah. how's it feel? And so to tell me first, since we, and the, today is May 12th, we've been in quarantine for how long? Two yeah. months? Two months. Okay. Yeah. And so what have you been doing in terms of comedy for all that time? Uh, Nina, I'm going to be honest. I have not felt very inspired, right? And leading up to this, I was writing every day and I keep a notebook on me. So whenever, you know, something, uh, a premise strikes or if I, you know, am riffing with friends and I tell a funny joke, I'll write it down and see if I can't incorporate it somehow later. And I, mean, I didn't even write anything for the first, you know, five weeks. And uh, I think part of it is just, I, I was hoping it wouldn't last that long. The other part is I have a little more um, stress on me on, on the other work side and especially with my council stuff right now and kind of being responsible for my small city of 50,000 and, you know, a lot of extra workload with, with the whole COVID thing going on. So, um, yeah, the first month or so was, was really tough, but uh, the last couple of weeks I've been kind of getting back to normal and writing and driving my wife crazy with my jokes. So that's good. So trying them out on your wife, huh? Always. Uh, she told me she would actually Venmo me if I stopped telling her jokes. So that was nice. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Like a little side um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're not doing any Zoom shows or anything? You know what? I um, The Zoom shows at first, I was watching a few. And, and I did a couple kind of Zoom open mics. There's a group for displaced comics that I, I'm a part of. And I've jumped in on some of those. The Zoom shows are tough for me, and I appreciate people who are doing them well because it's not easy. Um, for me, though, you know, especially with my eye issues, it, it's hard to see people's reaction, and I really need to, that to energy to keep going or, or, you know, to maybe pivot and go another direction or, or let something go. And um, if, I, if, if their screens are black and I can't see them, I'm really lost. And I know they're in the chat. You know, my bad eyes, I'm like this, trying to look at the chat. And, I'm, and it just, you know, I, I can't see any of it well. So uh, I haven't done too many of those. Um, you were nice enough to have me on the show and tell show, which was nice because you could see everybody and their mics are on. And, uh, and also, we would read the comments out loud, which that seems like that could be an access uh, accommodation that exactly. the host would read those out loud. So I don't know if that would be interesting to ask for that. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. It made it much, much easier, you know, to, to kind of interact with everybody because I'm sorry for the crappy pun, but just flying blind because you can't see anybody. And if you can't hear them, it's, uh, you know, who's, who knows how you're doing. It's, it's mm -hmm. tough. It's tough, especially being, you know, fairly new. And, you know, I was six months in, I was just starting to kind of build my confidence and, and get to where I was getting comfortable in front of groups telling, telling jokes. And I was in a, a nervous wreck every time before I went up. And even though I love it, it's, you know, it's your nerves get you. So uh, it's, it's a challenge. The Zoom shows are a challenge, you know, but I enjoy watching them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, what was your favorite part about doing comedy and your least favorite? <laughs> um, you know, my favorite part was probably something I didn't realize was even going to be part of it. And I kind of mentioned it before, but you don't realize um, sometimes how you're going to reach people, right? And sometimes folks come because they have a bad day or maybe they're just uh, there for a show and then you ha have something in common that that really hits them um, after that first show this point we were there and some guy kind of did a, a a low level heckle you know and so I started giving him a hard time back and and we bantered and had fun uh, and then we went to a bar afterwards and, and we walk in and one of the guys in there goes hey that was me and we were laughing and uh, I have a whole bit about kind of you know losing my eyesight and uh, when it originally happened, I had a double retina detachment and went completely dark for four and a half months. So I was telling some jokes around that, and there was a guy in the room, unbeknownst to me, that um, had recently lost his eyesight and was going through a lot of the same issues. So we ended up sitting there after the show talking, and he said, man, like, I really appreciated what you said because I'm not in a place where I can joke about it and stuff yet. And, you know, we had connected on this whole other level that uh, I did not expect, you know? And um, on top of the fun of telling jokes and, you know, the, uh, the joy I get when you make the crowd laugh, that was just a whole extra level of something that, you know, touched me and I did not expect it to happen. So uh, for anybody that's got to experience that, it, it's pretty great. Yeah. yeah, no, that's one of my favorite parts um, when I was in, Austin, Texas, like we just got off the plane, we got to the hotel, then we went right to an open mic, me and my husband. And I didn't even stutter a lot. Like I was so tired that I didn't even stutter. Like that's how tired I was. I just kind of phoned it in. And I waited until the end of the show. Um, I don't know why I should have gone home to sleep, but we waited. Um, and a 20 year old guy came up and he said, I talk like you, and this is the first time I've ever uh, ever seen anybody who talks like me and he was saying talks like me because he's so stuttered and he was talking around that word so mm -hmm. that he could mask the stutter and it's like and, and I told him about the na na national so stuttering association and, and we went into it with, uh, with them and like those are such really so special opportunities that and and when your jokes are received by somebody who has that personal experience and and as disabled comics it's so rare to be in front of a crowd that totally gets your premise much less your punchline um so i, I hope you can find some more opportunities to have the the those experiences yeah, the, the fact that it happened on my first night on stage, I, it's, it, it's kind of crazy. And it was almost uh, serendipitous in a lot of ways, right? And um, call it fate, call it what you want. But yeah, after that first night, I was, I was pretty hooked. So it's, yeah. You know. That's really neat. Um, what's your least favorite part about doing comedy? Ugh, the anxiety, actually Monday night mics, because I have a full-time job. So when I go out on Monday night, I just hurt for the whole week, right? I never really recover. Um, no, it's, it's a, a bit of the anxiety of trying out new jokes and, you know, willing to take a chance on something that you think is funny, but, you know, might not be well received or things. And um, that part is always kind of hard. And when you're not getting a lot back, from folks and and that's okay right I, I always say some I've seen some people and this blows me away um, turn on audiences and get mad at them right for not laughing and 
and I've always been a huge comedy fan. I, I'm from a comedy family. Um, and just because I'm not laughing out loud at something doesn't mean I'm not enjoying it. So uh, I, I, I get that part and how that can be frustrating. But, um, you know, just kind of the, I would say the anxiety of going up, especially new places, but being a new comic is, um, I, I suppose that's uh, pretty typical. Um, so you said that you're from a comedy fit family. What's that mean and well, how has that impacted you with this? My family's always had a good sense of humor, right? And my mom and dad are huge stand-up fans. And um, coming up through the 80s, my dad had uh, one of those black boxes. You remember that? I don't know if people are familiar, but when you had cable, you could buy a little black box for 100 bucks or something, and then you would get all the HBO and the pay-per-view, and everything was free, right? It was just unlimited. Um, so we would watch that stuff. And uh, my uh, dad was a big Sam fan, right? Sam Kinison, and he would... Uh, go see him whenever he was in town. My mom um, loves Gallagher. So funny. My dad uh, popped on some tickets for them to sit up front one time. And my mom still talks about that show and coming home covered in the goop. So, uh, but because we had that box, like there weren't, there weren't a whole lot of um, parental controls back then. And my family didn't care anyways, it was the eighties. So we would sit around and watch, uh, you know, prior, we would watch uh, all of the comic reliefs. We all sit down as a family and watch those every year, right? So those were always great. And then um, I was able to watch like Delirious and things. Uh, in the eighth grade, my mom had to come to school because I was repeating Delirious in my science class and got sent up to the office. And uh, I continued to do that through high school, right? I could do that that whole uh, routine front to back with even some of the laughs. It was, I, I loved it. So, you know, just kind of being fans of comedy and uh, an appreciation for that, that art form in my house, you know, was always, uh, they're, they're still funny. My family loves it. Yeah. I still enjoy it. But you don't want to be a comic? You know what? I probably, uh, like I said, a lot of my friends and family were not surprised. Um, I, I probably wish I would have gotten into it earlier. There was there was some opportunity when I would go see local shows at different places where I would BS with comics afterwards and liked hanging out and just kind of shooting the shit. But uh, I honestly, I didn't know anybody in it. I didn't even know kind of where to start or where to begin. Um, a few years back, actually, I met Dave because there was a there was an open mic uh, at Love It First Slice, which was a pizza place that burned down here in Newark. And we would go up there and, you know, I, we knew who each other were because it's Newark and we're this big. But um, that's where we started kind of developing a friendship. And I would go and sit up there. And that was my first open mic experience was going up and just watching people. Yeah. And so you and Dave didn't go to high school together? Uh, he's class of 94. I'm 96. So, yeah, we went to high school together. But he was a few years older than me. And, you know. Okay. Was, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. No, I picture, I thought you guys were like old, old friends, but that makes, okay. That, that I'm not places, as old as he is. <laughs> okay. Well, and I'm older than the, than the both of you. Um, okay. Um, how does it feel to have your, okay. So this is, this is why I really wanted to interview someone who is a year in because Okay, first of all, stand-up comedy, a relatively new art form. This is our first pandemic. You're the first generation of comics to have your to have your year hijacked. Your first year is hijacked. You can't develop yourself as an artist. You can't develop yourself as a professional. How's that feel? And what and and what is that like? Oh, it's it's frustrating. I, um, like I said, I, I feel like I had finally gotten to a place where I was doing a little better. The, Nina, to be honest with you, the first six months, I didn't even consider myself a comic, right? And I just was a guy out there trying to tell jokes and trying to do comedy and, and pick up what I could. And then it was interesting. Uh, slowly, some other comics started referring to me as a comic, which felt nice. Um, it was a little affirmation that at least I was walking down the right path. And then um, one night after a show, I had a great show one night and um, probably one of, one of my top three nights. 
And this drunk lady walked up to me afterwards and talked to me for 30 minutes how she always wanted to do comedy. And I thought, man, yeah, I, I, I'm officially a comedian because I've heard other folks talk about that, right? I have drunk people come up after show like, I always wanted to do comedy. I'd be so good at it. And they, I don't know if that's a sign that you've made it on some level, but um, yeah, I, I thought that was pretty funny. So I felt like part of the club at that point. <laughs> yeah. But like, is it like grief? Like I, I kind of, you know how like it's just the stages of grief where it's denial, acceptance. Uh, I think like so many comics are in denial thinking like, oh, this is going to be over soon and I'll be able to go to a mic. Yeah. Where are you at with all this? Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm kind of of the camp that it's probably going to last a lot longer than uh, we would all like. Even when it opens up, you know, we're not going it, to, it's not, they're not going to open the floodgates and let us all just go do things. And um, live events will certainly be limited by, you know, the places they're at and the amount of people they're allowed to go in them. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm disappointed. You know, it's, uh, like I said, I was eight months in. If we have to take the next four months off, I've already taken two. But you know, it's going to be four or five months before we really get back out there. And uh, that's 50% of my whole comedy career, you know, so I just, I wonder how much rust I'm going to have. Um, as I started, like I said, those last few months started getting good. I was trying to get out three, four or five nights a week. And when you're going up three nights a week, at least just your material gets better. Your confidence is, is better. Um, I, I, don't think I'm going to be very confident getting back out there. I think uh, the first month is probably going to be uh, a train wreck for a lot of us, just getting our feet back underneath us. Um, it's, it's, it's disappointing. You know, comedy for me was a great way to kind of relieve some of my day-to-day -day stresses, right? And unfortunately in politics, a, a lot of times, um, over time, right, you feel like you lose yourself, like I had mentioned. And uh, comedy, you know, put me back in touch with the, the person I, you know, liked about myself. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm unfortunately a realist in a lot of ways and, and just know it's going to be several more months. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something, and I hadn't mentioned this even to my wife, but we're here chatting and it's just you and me. So um, I, I considered, like, I had the conversation with myself, do I keep going? Right? Is this the proper time just to say, fuck it and bow out? And, um, you know, I wrestled with that for, you know, a couple of weeks and, and ultimately like, yeah, I love it. I'm going to keep going. And, you know, I, let's be honest, I have no illusions of grandeur here, right? I am not going to be the next uh, 41 year old com comedic sensation, right? It's, not, it's just not going to happen, but uh, I enjoy it. Um, at the local level, much like my politics. Uh, I enjoy the camaraderie amongst uh, the other comics and kind of the grind, right? I'm a, I'm a worker. I always have been. So I enjoy kind of the, the process of cutting your teeth. And mm -hmm. I went through an apprenticeship with the Millwrights and I, I consider this uh, my second apprenticeship, my comedy apprenticeship, if you will. And uh, so I don't mind putting in the work. I, I actually enjoy it. You know, I don't mind being up late drinking coffee and in dive bars and things and, and enjoying that, that scene. But um, what, why do you think you like it? What is that thing in you that, that, that makes you like that? Well, it's, you know, in a lot of ways it's, it's tough, right? Like, People think it's all glamour and fun and, and Netflix specials. <laughs> and that, that could not be further from the truth, you know? So uh, you, you got to have kind of a passion for it. And I've always loved telling jokes. And, you know, uh, some of the best moments that have carried me are maybe those unscripted things that happen when you're on stage, right? Like a, a solid interaction with people and you do something off the cuff or you're riffing and you get this huge pop from the crowd. And, um, I mean, that'll carry me for weeks. Right. And when I'm frustrated either with politics or in my normal job, right, because I bid construction work um, on a day to day, that's how I make my living. It's uh, it, that can be a grind. Right. And it can be uh, 
stressful and upsetting at times. You know, uh, one of the things I don't talk about in uh, politics a lot is it, since I've been elected, I'm in my second term. Um, I've come home and cried like three times. <laughs> I get so bad some nights, you know, and uh, that's never happened to comedy. So, <laughs> so that's well, good. You are still young. You are only yeah. seven months in. So right. I like to think that, that <laughs> your crying <laughs> time was going to come. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's a nice break, and you know I have a, a five year old daughter, so I spend a lot of time at home. And between you know work and city stuff and my family life, uh, my wife is awesome, and she lets me go out a few nights a week, and uh, that's that's kind of my time, right? And yeah, I'm I'm doing it and entertaining people and stuff, but a lot of it is is for me. I I, I just enjoy it. Um, I don't know what it is exactly. Now you know what, Nina. Honestly, that's a great question because I hadn't really thought about what it is exactly or specifically. Maybe it's you know a combination of all those things. Um, I've gone out and bombed. Those nights aren't aren't great. I had a rough night at the caravan one time and just like oh god, that was brutal. Um, but even that was okay. You know, I, it, you leave there feeling all right, even if you don't have a great night. Um, for the most part, you have fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. well, and part of the hard work is bombing. It's just part of it. Yeah, it was, it's funny, because Dave was with me that night, and he had even told me previous to that um, <clears throat> that he was looking forward to watching me bomb eventually, because he said that I had done pretty good so far in the beginning, and that uh, I was lucky I hadn't bombed yet. So I went up, I bombed badly and then he came up after me and and talked about how bad i bombed for the next two minutes which you know is is dave style <laughs> so it, you know, yeah. the other comics were great though they said uh dude you open mics don't count as bombings right so that was yeah nice. they i i i think they totally count okay. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So, and, and I think you may know more than most comics on this, but how do you think the landscape of stand-up comedy is going to change in terms of uh, when we'll be able to have shows, what those shows will look like, where will the tables be, all of that stuff. What do you think that's going to look like? I think we're still a few months out, right? Um, probably phase three if you're paying attention to that stuff. So uh, just before sports and concerts and uh, large events open up, unfortunately, it, it's kind of a wait and see. They're gonna look at you know numbers and infection rates and testing and then, so there's no real timeline for rolling things out. Uh, when it does happen though, it's gonna be limited. You know, they're gonna say, okay, if your capacity is 100 people, maybe you can have 25 people in here. And, you know, when it comes to hanging out with certain groups, they're going to say no more, than, no more than 10. Sorry, the dogs are barking. Um, and then hopefully that'll bump up to, you know, 50 people and things like that. So it's, it's going to be a while. And unfortunately, bars are going to be one of the last things that open, you know, because people drink and hang on each other and stuff. And um, that's where we get a lot of our opportunity is at bar shows and and things that's you know 90 percent of the stuff i did was in a bar so that's that's uh that's gonna be Whoa. tough yeah yeah i've, I've kind of thought that maybe what's gonna happen and i was talking to dina ware who had a lot of really, really good insights on stuff um but how like in sh like we talked about comedy darwinism that it's gonna be super competitive um to 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 be on shows and what I think might happen is the open mics may happen in Zoom land and then, um, and then having showcases so that there could be more control over the environment. But I don't know. I could see that happening and that's going to be, you know, tough for people like me who are, you know, a year in and use those um, open mics as a way to kind of develop new material and, and develop just the, our skills. And, and, and the networking aspect too. Yeah. Oh, because definitely. More experienced comics are not paying attention to you at a Zoom show. 
Yeah, no, yeah. They, they ignore you even more than a regular open mic. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, you know, I, the, the opportunity uh, that I've had, uh, a lot of it come from people I met at, at mics and things. And, you know, I said, hey, you were pretty funny. Why don't you, I'll give you five minutes on this or, or something else. And it's, um, you know, that's, that's just one more avenue that, you know, a lot of us are going to miss out on. So... But then again, you know, everything evolves, everything changes. Um, I like to think that we're a resilient group and, you know, if things start going outside, right, maybe there's more of that kind of a uh, show, right, because you feel a few more people. Um, even though just, just the act of passing the mic off from different people. Sorry, my kids, my daughter's screaming in the background. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, like it just, handing the mic to somebody and they spit all over it and then you hand it back to the host and they hand it to the next person right like if if COVID is going to run rampant in any communities it's ours yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and also like what's it going to be like doing doing comedy in a face mask like I could imagine myself putting on a mask because of because there's so many times when I look at the mic and, the, and my lipstick's on the mic because my mouth has touched it you know, like that just can't happen anymore. No, and I have a bad habit of um, just from doing, you know, events and things, public events over the years. Uh, I tend to set the mic right on my chin. And then, ooh, ooh. I know, okay. well, I use my own mic typically, right? So I've had to really, that's been one of the things I've been training myself is to pull it away. But if I hold it stationary here, yeah, I could kind of control the volume of my voice and it, it's a more consistent sound. And, and I'm always impressed about people who can have it out here and keep that consistent sound because I do this a lot, right? Like I, it, it gets away from me. And um, yeah. so, you know, bad little bad habits like that that, <laughs> that I've developed and need to fix. But I'm not the only one. So it's, it's going to be uh, interesting seeing how that part place you know plays out maybe we start bringing our own mics and things i i don't know yeah, yeah i know I, I i thought about that too um what do you think or will there be any changes in the sensibilities of humor both for the comics and for the audience because this like i said this is our first pandemic in terms of comedy but i wonder how how like the black plague changed art and would something like this change the art form or would it change the sensibilities in terms of what people laugh at and what they think is acceptable to laugh at? Well, um, I would say that cancel culture has been a bit good uh, warm up for some of that, right? I think people are already kind of, um, uh, probably, I don't want to necessarily say more PC, but I think they're a little, uh, more thoughtful about the jokes that they tell and, and they don't tell. And, and that's good because I, you know, I've never been a fan of um, like Lisa Lampanelli style comedy, right? I like more of a uh, clever kind of uh, comedy, but I also have a dark sense of humor and not everybody appreciates that, right? So um, I imagine it'll be more of the same. We're not going to People aren't going to want to hear COVID jokes all the time and quarantine jokes all the time. That'll, that'll get old. But then also, you know, uh, folks are going to be on edge and a little uh, uneasy coming out of this. So I think um, one of the best uh, pieces of advice that I've gotten and I've ever given anybody, whether you were doing a, uh, a, a political speech or comedy or what, whatnot, was just to know your audience. Right. And that can be uh, tough sometimes walking in to some place where it's just a random group. Let's say it's not an organization, you know, um, pay attention to the people in front of you. Right. See what's working and what's not. If you crack a joke and people, oh, you know, probably best to stay away from that topic. So it's, you know, it's just kind of uh, also a matter of being self-aware in a lot of ways, I think, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so self-aware how, what do you mean by that in, in this context? Well, I find some very inappropriate things to be hilarious, right? Because I have more of a dark sense of humor. And like, like I said, um, 
But just because you think it's funny doesn't mean everybody there is going to think it's funny or it's going to be received well. So, uh, you know, ask any of the comics who thought it'd be a good idea to tell a Kobe joke. You know, those didn't go over very well. And uh, you didn't hear much of that. So I think it'll be, you know, kind of along those lines. People are going to get out, tell some jokes. Somebody's going to have the nerve to talk, tell, you know, jokes about people dying. And um, they're going to get booed off. You know, I think uh, people aren't going to be ready for some of that. So um, I think the self-aware part would be knowing that even though you find it funny at home behind closed doors or you can joke with some of your personal friends about it, um, it might not be audience appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Um, so are there any questions that you think I should have asked or that you would like to talk about? Uh, other things you would like Ooh, to talk about? Um, I don't know. I, uh, I, I see people's frustrations, right? I see people uh, online, comics and other folks, everybody's chomping at the bit, at the bit to get out there. And um, I appreciate that, right? Because uh, I want to get out there too. But, you know, I, I, honestly, I, I don't think it's a, a great idea to be pushing that envelope just yet. And um, I've had some folks ask me, why aren't we doing more as a city? And, you know, I would say that I don't have the luxury of basing my decisions off of Facebook posts, right? When you're responsible for 50,000 people and the well-being of your community. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to make those decisions based off of um, Facebook uh, scholars, right? So that's, but I'm dying to get out there too. Right? I'm dying to get back to work and things. So I'm hoping that as we move forward, we can kind of uh, come up with fun and, and unique ways to, to still get out there and perform, which is actually something I've kind of been working on on the side, which is, uh, you know, it has some potential, hopefully. So do you uh, want to talk about that now that you've baited us? No, like, <laughs> would that lead? No, you know what? Um, I had mentioned that I've been hosting the movies in the park here in town for several years. I have a giant inflatable movie screen and you can see it from, you know, a half a mile away. Uh, we also do crazy Christmas light displays at our house. So we're one of those houses that you pull up and you turn your radio and the lights go to the music, you know, that's us. Um, so I have an FM transmitter and I've been wanting to do a drive-in movie for our high school seniors here this year because let's face it, it, it sucks to be a senior this year. And while it's a uh, small, uh, you know, thing to do, it, at least it's something for them, you know, to have a night to come out. And um, I was talking to a couple of local comics that would hopefully get to come out and maybe warm up the crowd before the movie. And, you know, everybody would be in their cars and they could stand up in front of the screen and we could pipe it in through the FM transmitter. So, things like that that are just kind of unique and, and out of the box, maybe combining events um, to, to create some opportunity to do, do some live comedy. Um, we haven't been able to do it yet. Alameda County's uh, has not let up on the drive-ins the way Contra Costa and Santa Clara have yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I have the uh, benefit of kind of having the inside track with the Board of Health though. So I'm, you know, continuing to work with them. And as soon as uh, something can open up, we, we will be doing that. And hopefully, you know, it'll be different, right? It'll be telling jokes to cars and they'll be honking and flashing lights instead of laughing. I, I don't know, you know, in, in my mind, that's how it's going to go. So, but and, so and, and uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about some of the Easter services that I saw on the news where they had like a drive-in church. Mm -hmm. And they did it like that. Yeah. That maybe looking at the models that churches have done because that's more of a universal thing than stand-up comedy. So we could see what that what's been done in Korea um, because that's where I saw that it's a drive-in church. So looking at those kinds of things might be one step that can start to engage this or re-engage co comedy again. Did we just come up with the first drive-in comedy club idea? Did I think so. Oh, we did. heard it here first. <laughs> well, that would be fun, you know, and I think that a lot of people would actually be interested in that. We'd probably get a better turnout than uh, 
a, a lot of regular shows, right? Just because people are dying to get out and, and do something and feel a connection with folks right now, either with people and or with their communities, you know, it would be, yeah. it would be nice. And, and comics are so like it, it, inconsiderate. Sometimes I could see them also parking in the front because they're like, Oh, I got here early parking in the front and messing the whole thing up. Just like they take up to tables in the front that should be for patrons. So I can already see where it's going to go wrong. Yeah, park off on the side. Right. You know, it was nice. And like, I, 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 I'm just going to throw this out there. I had no idea that when you're um, doing comedy regularly, one, one of the fun things that I found out was you can get into some clubs for free and sit in the back. Right. So I was just starting to get, you know, to, to receive that benefit. And, um, and now it's gone. It's and gone. now they're going to forget who you are. <laughs> yeah. So, it, well, it's nice, right? It's, it's cool to go in and kind of sit in the back and, and just watch and learn and being part of everything and checking out folks style. You can learn a lot by watching. I tell people that all the time, right? Like you learn a lot by doing, but if you just be quiet and watch sometimes you can uh, learn quite a bit. So yeah, exactly. Hey, you, you asked All me right. if I wanted to plug anything. Can yeah. I do that before we go? Yeah, please. So, I was just joking. Don't watch my council meetings. They're really boring. But um, you know what? Uh, one of the guys who I love, DNA, uh, he had just opened the comedy lab down in Santa, Santa Cruz. And he's such a good guy because I get there late because I'm driving from the East Bay. And he always slid me in even for a few minutes, um, even when the list was closed. So uh, if you get the chance right, to get some tickets. He's doing all kinds of live shows right now, uh, four or five nights a week. I've seen some of those Zoom shows. So if you get the chance, uh, buy some tickets, support the Comedy Lab. We want to see them make it out of this, right? They just hung up that beautiful new sign, so we want to keep it there for years to come. And then- He um, had his first anniversary um, the first week of March, and then this happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's shitty. Although kudos to him, he was one the first place in Santa Cruz to, to close down uh, out of an abundance of caution. And I, I think people really, uh, you know, beat him up about it for a little bit. But then uh, it turns out he was right. So, you know, kudos for him. And then also, uh, I saw this. It's, it's a GoFundMe for uh, Punchline San Francisco. And it's not for the club. It's for all the people working there, right? So... All of your wait staff, your bartenders, all the folks who um, haven't been able to work and really kind of depend on the club and stuff. Uh, if you have a couple of fajules to throw at them, go to the GoFundMe punchline page and uh, give them a couple bucks because I know they can use them. So. Yeah, I think that's okay. it. Okay, anything else, Mr. Politician? Uh, vote for Bucci. <laughs> okay, vote Bucci, everybody. Thanks yeah. so much, Mike. Yeah, Appreciate your time. Not.